Alright, you, you can leave. Oh, the gossip. <laughs> no. Anything else? Great. What do you want? I'm all learn about it. Um, holy living. Holy living. We did that a couple years ago. Well, that's an office. That's, that's a good one. I was on the spot. Anything else? Retreating? <laughs> Reagan said retreating. Is that right? Mm. Sleeping. sleeping. I like sleeping. Yeah. The godliness. And food. Food. Good. Rest. Rest. Good. <laughs> Food. Rest would be a good one. Yeah. Okay, cool. I'll keep that in mind. Great. Right. Lights out at midnight. Lights out at midnight. You guys are going home at midnight. Mm -hmm. So, actually, what is it going to be like? We'll tell you. We'll tell you guys later. I'm just telling you, mark your calendar down. All right. So, you guys plan. It's a weekend. Do you want to do that? 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 
Cool. And the second thing, all you high schoolers, who's 14 and older? Raise your hand. I'll be 14. In February. If you're 14 or older, high schoolers, do you have the, you have the opportunity to participate in VBS this summer? Yes. Yes. If I'm here. Uh, when is it? It's in the June. It's in the June. Oh, so VBS. So if you guys are if you guys are new or you haven't been here before, what we do in youth ministry is that we take our high school students and we take a week intentionally to be a mission together to do VBS at our church. And this year, if you guys participate in one at Cornerstone, we're going to do another one across the state. We do the same thing, like spend the night over there, spend the whole week over on the western side of Montana, and be able to go to like Glacier, which would be really cool. But it's only for people who commit to doing and training for the VBS for here in Billings and for the other one that's in the second week of July. All right, so high schoolers, if you want to do that, Please come and talk to me after you group, and we'll get started with that. Yes, How far in advance do you have to commit? After the advance. So like from March, like the midway of March, all the way to June. It's like eight weeks. So you got it. for the ones that are like super busy in the summer, can we do an alternate, like go downtown and help with the soup kitchen trip? Sure. If you, want, you, you, want, you want to put it on, that'd be great. Service project. Sure, that'd be great. Would anybody want to do go downtown? We're intentionally like to like all the kids that I wanted down there, that's gonna be the kids that we're gonna do the PBS for. So like last year, Silas he like led the games, him and Jace did the games, Sadie and Lily did Sadie did the crafts for all the kids, Lily did the the movie for all the kids. Who else was there last year? Who else? Wait, what kind Adeline of helped with Bible teaching. Clara was there with a yeah. leader, helper, right? Brady Gahagan. Brady, and, yep. So. May they have fun in Tennessee. <laughs> yeah. Who else was there? You said they're like, rest in peace. Rest in peace. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, for 14, you have to be 14 or older to participate. So if, right? I, so if I turn 14? No, nope, you got to be 14 now. Disappointment. What if he's, um, what if he's 14 like, at the end of the month? What did I say? You're going to be 14 now. My birthday was tomorrow. Oh, you got to be in high school or 14, right? Sound good? Everyone give me a thumbs up. I don't see all the thumbs up yet. Still waiting on a couple thumbs up. Still waiting on a couple thumbs up. Still waiting on a couple thumbs up. Thumbs up for what? Do you understand? Like, do I understand? I thought you were like trying to like... Like, are you signing up for this? Like, I don't know. Like, do, you, do you understand? I thought you were like signing a contract right now. Nope. <laughs> that's it. That's all. All right. Cool. We got those two things out of the way. So we've been starting a vibe and doing that kind of stuff this week and getting in the Bible. What's some of the things the Lord's been teaching this week? I, I can go first. For you guys. Uh, I love Proverbs. I'm loving to go through Proverbs again and like seeing all the sayings of wisdom and how they apply to my life, and one of them was uh, Proverbs 11.30. It says, the fruit of the righteous is a tree of life. So it's like those who live in the Lord, abiding, flourishing, like their life is like this tree that you come and enjoy the fruits of their lives, and whoever captures souls is wise. So those who walk by and see your life that day, it's like you, you win them over to life, to this flourishing life. So I thought that was a wonderful witness with your, it's not like I have to go say something, spectacularly intelligent, I'd have to let my life bear more fruit. So those are great. So anyone else get something out of Persian in the Word or something the Lord's teaching them? Your time in God's Word. Yeah? Patient. My sister had a really annoying friend over. <laughs> <laughs> so what what in God's Word helped you be patient? She was rude. Wait. So the Lord providentially brought you someone that tested you to be more patient. How'd you do? You passed the test? 75. That's better than 50. That's great. Great job. Who else? What else?
just like, no. I I like it. Yeah. It's like, I like God that forbid. because a, a lot of people point to like, well, faith is a mustard seed, but then you read that with the Romans and he calls you to a big faith, right? And I'm just like, oh, oh, but there's some accountability there too. But that means like, wait, but that does mean, does it mean that you're only saved by doing works? No, no. Wait, see, I can go do whatever I want. No. no. Right. <laughs> He's very, he's very careful. Yeah. Let's get one more. I don't know. There was a verse that stood out to me, but I can't remember what it was. All good. I remember something stood out. I don't know what it was. Oh, I feel that way about Romans. Yeah. 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 You guys ever heard the proverb that whoever shuts his mouth is considered wise? It's like literally you're smarter if you don't say anything. Take that tip. Mm-hmm. Why, y'all? Is that why you do that? <laughs> I'm, so, I'm so smart, y'all. He never says anything in two minutes. Yeah, we'll get we'll get quick soon. Okay, awesome, cool. Well, so throughout the week, be thinking of things you can come and share with everyone. Because what's really cool about us doing this thing about word planners being in the word together is that one thing can encourage me and then someone can see the exact same thing and say something completely different from the same verse and it encourages both of us right to grow in the Lord so that'd be something we could encourage each other with grow with talk about with your groups with your leaders and it's just something to be connected as a youth group so continue to do that youth group so be writing down things you see throughout the week and let us know about it all right sound good All right, let's all stand and sing to the Lord together. Go to page 35. Sing praises to his name. Lift up a song to him who rides through the deserts. His name is the Lord, Yahweh. Exalt before him. He's father to the fatherless, protector of widows. In God is God in his holy habitation. Lord, you are great and mighty. Your name is exalted above all the earth. Lord, help us to praise you, to know you, to be changed by seeing you through your word. Lord, help us be changed to leave here throughout the week to grow more fruits in our lives that then wins people to life in Christ. Thanks. In precious son's name. Amen. All right, let's sing with our voices to the Lord. Praise to the Lord, the Almighty, the King of creation. All my soul praise him, for he is thy help and salvation. All ye who Sing. 
copy of God's Word and go to the book of Exodus. The book of Exodus. Tell me what happened last week with Exodus. What's going on? Raise your hand. What's going on in the book of Exodus? The last two chapters. First chapters 1 and 2 of Exodus. Okay. Who's that one guy? Moses. Moses was. I think. Are you thinking of Joseph? Okay. Joseph brought his into Egypt, and then who did we hear about last week, Ben? Moses. Moses. Right. Moses. We're about Moses. Exodus. We're on Exodus chapter three. Exodus chapter three. Moses. Right, we're still seeing how God's kingdom is coming through his covenant promises, even in the land of Egypt, where God's people are under slavery, under oppression, they're, they're in misery and bitter work. Nothing's really looking good for the people of Israel, for God's chosen people, yet God's doing something. First with some women who are fearless against Pharaoh, who fear God over him, and they do what's right to protect the unborn children. Children who were born and don't throw them into the Nile. And then Moses, by God's providence, is saved in the ark in the Nile, right, in his basket. Become now a, a child of Pharaoh. And Moses has a sense of justice, right? He loves to do what's right. He wants to protect the vulnerable. He does that with the Egyptian slave and then with uh, the women in Midian. And now he's in Midian, married, has kids. Uh, when the Lord heard all of Israel's groaning. And he remembered his covenant with Abraham from of old, that this is going to come true. And God's doing something. He saw his people, and God knew in the last chapter. So let's pray, and let's look at Exodus chapter 3. We're about God's name. God's name. Lord, we come to your word, and you tell us who you are through it. Even the words that we have, you condescend to tell us about yourself. But Lord, there's times in scripture where we see special moments where you fully reveal who you are and what you do. Lord, help us to see who you are through your name and what you do, what you're going to through this book and, and history, and Lord, we can fully see who you are through your Son. We long to see you face to face in heaven, so help us to see you through your word. In Christ's name, amen. amen. I have a question for you. Who's watched, watched or read Romeo and Juliet? Who's actually, who's read it? Who's seen a play or something somewhere? Okay. Who's watched the movie? I have not watched the movie yet. Okay. You guys remember that scene that Romeo's talking about, a rose, and he says, what's in a name? That if a rose is called by any other thing, would it smell as sweet? Do you guys remember that? Yeah. Whoever said it. <laughs> what is it, Juliet? Yeah. He's just talking about Romeo. Why are you Romeo? I want to oh. who are Romeo and the other tribe. See, I bought you. Well, the question really is, like, what's in a name? What's in a name that you associate things with what they are? What's, what names of things, when you hear it, you think of something related or unlike it? Anything come to mind? So when I say, like, if you know a guy that's like, man, Bill is a pig. Is Bill really a pig? No, but if I, if I know that Bill is stinky and smelly and a little chubby, it's like, beg, beg Bill... Probably looks like a pig. He, he acts like a pig, so Bill's a pig. Go for a pig. You can name a pig Bill. Cool. Okay? So names have a way of identifying things with other things. So think of, or like representing what things mean, right? So Abraham, you guys know what Abraham means? It means father of a multitude. Wouldn't that be pertinent if God says, I'm going to give you tons of children <laughs> that are more than the sands of the sea? Okay, or how about Isaac? You guys know what Isaac means? No. Something Jane. promise. No. Dana. Yeah. Laughter. Yeah. yeah. Because when Sarah heard that she's going to have a baby, she laughed. Because she was laughing at God. And so now she has a son who actually laughs because now he's born. Or you know what Jacob means? The deceiver. The deceiver. <laughs> so he's named the deceiver and his whole life is the one that deceives people and supplants things. Then he gets his name changed to what? Israel. Israel, which means what? Wrestles with God. Wrestles with God. Right? Cool. Cool. Cool better, way better than the Caesars. Right, but names have meaning. They tell us about what the person is, or especially in the Bible, names have a lot of meaning to relate to what pe who people are, their character. 
And so in this scene in Exodus 3, we get a, a glimpse in, a, in a, a holy section of scripture. We get to see God naming himself and telling us who he is. And he, by his name, he tells us what he's like. So let's, let's dive in and look at Exodus chapter 3. So Moses is in Midian. Word and first father is a shepherd. Right? So he's from a prince of Egypt, all the way down to a lowly shepherd, not even watching his own flock. And he goes through the Mount of Horeb, the mountain of God. In verse 2, it says, The angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire out of the midst of a bush. And he looked, and behold, the bush was burning, yet it was not consumed. That would be very strange to see, right? Every time you guys have a campfire, or you light the fire, the wood starts to burn, and then the wood starts to crumble in the fire, because literally the, the wood's being consumed by the heat to give off the energy, right? Consumed by the fire. Well, in this way, all this, this fire is coming up, and its energy source is not the bush, right? The, the bush is on fire, the bush is engulfed in fire, and yet the fire, its energy is not the bush. It's from somewhere else, from someone else, from someone who has life in himself. So he sees this strange thing, and Moses said, I'm going to turn aside to see this great sight, why this bush is not burned. And verse 4 says, when the Lord saw that he had turned aside to see, God called to him, out of the bush says, Moses, Moses. And Moses said, here I am. And he said, do not come near. Take off your sandals. Take your sandals off your feet. For the place on which you are standing is holy ground. And God said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look at God. So I want you to see just one thing here, right? This is a, a strange sight. Moses is being called by God into this conversation with him in this burning bush. And the one thing I want you to know is to remember that God is holy. God is holy. And what holy means is that things get set apart for a special use. Right? So the bush and that fire and that area, it wasn't holy when Moses was just walking around on the mountain. But it became holy when God's presence comes down and he is actually in the bush and speaking with Moses, his presence comes down and makes things holy. He makes things holy. So Moses doesn't tread lightly. He doesn't come in however way he wants to, saying, hey, what's up, God? How's it going? No, he, he's fearful. He wants to cover his face, not even look at the Lord, at the God of heaven and earth. And he treads lightly on this holy ground. So it's just to remind us that when we come into worship, when we come see the Lord and to, to know him. He is holy. He is different. He is other than we are. And he needs to be, needs to be treated as such. Just like Moses is. He's, a, he's afraid <coughs> to look at the Lord. So we shouldn't be willy-nilly coming in how we want to when we come to worship and know the Lord. So that's Moses being called in by the flaming bush. And two, now God has seen in verse 7, God's seen the affliction of his people He's heard their cries. He knows their sufferings. So God is intimately knowledgeable about everything that's going on with his people. For the last 400 plus years, he knows exactly what's happening. Right? I've, I've seen what's going on. I've seen all the suffering they've been through, all the, the hardships they're doing. I've heard their cries for help, saying, Lord, save us from this slavery. And I know what they're going through. I, I can see it. I know exactly what they're doing. And so I've come down to deliver them out of this. I'm gonna, I've heard all these things, I've seen it, I know it, now I'm going to do something about it. And Moses, you're going to be my guy. Down in verse 10 it says, Come, I will send you to Pharaoh, that you may bring my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. Right? How would you feel if Moses, if you got called by God, on the flaming bush, saying, hey, you're going to be my guy, to go take out the most powerful guy in all the known world, and you're going to save my people from all this bondage. How would you feel? Fully equipped? Yeah, let's go. No. What do you think Moses says? What do you think is his first response? Uh, <laughs> throw up, right in the spot. Look at verse 11. It says, Moses says to God, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the children of Israel out of Egypt? He's like, I'm nobody. Like, I'm, I was a prince of Egypt. I'm a nobody shepherd now. I'm nobody. Like, what can I do? I'm not going to be able to do anything against this powerful guy. Like, I, I'm, I'm powerless. But God said to him, I will be with you. I'll be with you. I'm going to go with you. 
and I'm gonna call you, you're my man to do this, I'm gonna go with you to do this, and here's a sign to show you that's gonna happen, you're gonna come back, right back to this spot, and you're gonna worship me on this same mountain. So Moses is God's man, even though Moses doesn't wanna be God's man, he's gonna be the man for the job, and God's gonna point him to this task. And then look at verse 13. This is kind of the, the main section that I want to look at today. It says, Then Moses said to God, If I come to the people of Israel and say to them, The God of your fathers has sent me to you, and they ask me, What is his name? What shall I say to them? So you got to remember, back in this time in Egypt, there is so many quote-unquote gods of Egypt. There's the God of the sun. There's the God of the Nile. There's the God of the dead. There's a God of the living. There's a God over all the gods. There's a God of the trees. There's a God of all sorts of stuff. There's a God for every single thing you see, right? And even probably for Moses, he grew up in that, right? He grew up around all the Egyptian gods, probably doing all the things they were doing over there. He's grown up as a kid, going to the temples and whatever they're doing for rituals. And now he's a God of Abraham and Isaac. And even then, probably there's some, like, who is this God? What's his name? Is he the same one that delivered Isaac? From Abraham's sacrifice? Is he the one that wrestled with Jacob by the river and renamed him? Or is it the one that's all powerful over all things? Who? Which God is it? Which God is this God? And verse 14, God says to Moses, I am who I am. I am who I am. And he said, This is the people, tell, say to the people of Israel that I am has sent me to you. God also said to Moses, say this to the people of Israel, the Lord, all capital letters, the Lord. Oh, let me get this up here. Has sent me to you. The Lord, the God of our fathers, God of Abraham, of Isaac, and Jacob, has appeared to me, saying, I have observed what you have done to you in Egypt. So when you guys see this word, Lord, you guys know why it's all capital letters? It's not a typo. You know what? You know why? What, which name? Why isn't it not like this? Ella, you know? It's a stand-in for his representative. Yeah. Oh, yeah, I spelled it wrong. <laughs> Yahweh. Yahweh. And you probably could spell it differently. You put a what? An A in there? But that's what we get is like, this is God's name. I am who I am. I will be who I will be. I will do what I will do. And God says, you can't name me, but I can name myself. This is who I am. I am. I just, I am. I always have been. I always will be. I always will be in the future from everlasting to everlasting. I am God. Even before there was no such thing as time or even an idea of space and matter, I always have been. And when I created all things, I still am who I was before those things. And when everything's gone and the earth has fallen away, I still will be. This is the God who is. And he wants to make sure that this God is above all. He's the word transcendent. That means he's above everything, everywhere. He's, he's not like us. God is completely different. He, he has life within himself, right? Everything else around us, including us, have our being from God himself. We, we live and move and have our being from God in us. God doesn't need anyone or anything to live or to be and always has been. God's different than us. And he wants us to know that in his name. So every time that people in Israel saw this name, Lord, or Yahweh, it was such a, a holy name they didn't want to say it wrongly or irreverently. So they just they spelled it like this. So this is where we get that name nowadays. So every time you see this in the Old Testament and in the New Testament, it's over 6,000 times and you see all capital Lord it's Yahweh, Yahweh, the Lord God, Yahweh God. So he's telling them, this, this is what I do, this is who I am. I'm going to 
save my people. I'm going to redeem you guys from what you're suffering. Let's also just, with, with Scripture, God tells us who he is by his name, but also by what he does. So God's describing himself like, this is who I am. I am who I am. I'm going to show you also who I am by what I do, by rescuing you from Egypt, by personally saying, like, come and follow me. I'm coming to this mountain and worship me. Because he's also, though he's transcendent above everything else. How many people do you know in the world that just believe that there is a God? There is a God. Right, have you guys heard that before? That there's a God somewhere around there. I don't know who he is, but he's powerful and strong. He's like this force, kind of like the forces with me in Star Wars, that kind of God. That's that's what we're talking about. That's that's just people saying there is a God. But forces don't have feelings. Forces don't have, you can't have a relationship with gravity, right? You can fall off a building and gravity's gonna suck you right down, but it's not gonna help you. Like, it's not gonna come for you, right? God's not just a force and a power of things over all the creation. He is, he's also personal. He also <coughs> knows everything you're going through. He's going to save his people from all their hardships and come and meet with them and be, like, they'll be his people. They'll be his, his covenant people after they, res they rescue him. And so, as we're going to see in the unfolding of Exodus, right, all of this, all of the acts of plagues, all the acts of miracles, all the things God does to save his people, he's showing his character. He's showing who he is through what he does and what he says. So God's going to take him out of this land of Egypt to a land full of milk and honey. That sounds wonderful. And he's going to tell Pharaoh, he's like, hey, you're going to tell Pharaoh Moses that you're going to let my people go. Come and worship us. And then, but I know, verse 19, that the king of Egypt will not let you go unless compelled by a mighty hand. So I'll stretch out my hand and strike Egypt with all the wonders that I will do in it. After that, he will let you go. All right, and then you're going to plunder all the Egyptians. So not only are you going to like be free from slavery, you're going to take all of their possessions and take it with you out of the lands and, and leave them worse off than they were before. Right? <coughs> Guys, let me tell you, like that is impossible, humanly speaking. These slaves are not going to be able to do that on their own whatsoever. Like, if someone tells you this is just a story, it's impossible, humanly speaking, to have this happen. Only by God coming down, intervening for his people, are his people ever going to be rescued and become their own nation. Because it's, it's not possible without God. It's not possible without God. He comes to save his people. So God reveals himself in his names most fully he never revealed to Abraham that I am who I am or to Isaac or to Jacob but now in Exodus in this time he's saying I am who I am he's revealing himself but still it's still hidden there's still a veil over who God is we still don't quite know who he is in the Old Testament there's still things that don't quite make sense it doesn't make sense until you get to the New Testament so actually turn with me to John chapter Eight. Turn with me to John chapter 8. So Jesus is fighting with these Pharisees about who they are, about they're these sons of Satan, that truly if you know the Son, he'll set you free indeed. And they're just still arguing with him, saying that Jesus doesn't know what he's talking about. And Jesus is saying like, hey, if in verse 51, chapter 8, says, Truly, truly, I say to you, if anyone keeps my word, he will never see death. And the Jews said to him, Now we know that you, you have a demon. Abraham died, as did the prophets. See, you say, if anyone keeps my word, he will never die. Are you greater than our father Abraham who died and the prophets who died? Who do you make yourself out to be? Who do you make yourself out to be? It's like Jesus trying to tell us, like, hey, I'm, I am who I say I am but I'm going to tell you exactly who I am. Look at verse 58. Jesus said to him, Truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. And that word, it's not just like, I am. It literally means like, I am who I am. I am Yahweh. I am that, I am that God. I am that one. So Jesus, he fully 
more than God can tell us. Like God has to come down and live with us to show us who he is in the flesh. Because in John 14, one of the disciples saying, like, Jesus, just show us. Just show us the Father. Just show us Yahweh. Just show us that, and we'll be satisfied. And he says, man, do you not know who I am? If you've seen me, you've seen him. We're one. If you've seen me, you know exactly who my Father is. So only in the New Testament, only fully in Jesus, do you see fully who God is. He is Father, Son, and Spirit. Which is beautiful to say, like, what is what is the compassion of father? And when you see a dad who loves his kids in action, what does that tell you about him and his love for them? How can you describe that like, by seeing that in action? That's who God is for us. He's our father who loves us, who gave his, his son to die for us, that we may be adopted by the Spirit to know him and to be in his family and be one with him. And that's the beautiful, fullest sense of this God who comes to save us. He didn't he doesn't just come down in fire and in fear. He comes down as a person to rescue his people from slavery to sin. And it's, it's beautiful to see that there's nothing else that God can say besides then giving us Jesus. So if we want to know who God is, we've got to look at Exodus 3 and see his name. We'll also look to Christ. Who, he's the exact imprint, the exact person, the exact image of God that we can see. So, be encouraged. Look to the Lord. Look to the Son, as we can see God fully displayed. And look to the things He's going to do in the Exodus that shows His character, who God is. We'll look at Lord willing next week. Let's pray. Lord, Father in heaven, we're thankful that you reveal yourself in ways that tell us who you are, that you're not a God who is shrouded in mystery. Lord, you, you tell us who you are. You tell us what you do. and You give us a glimpse of yourself, Lord. Help us to look to you, Christ, and see the fullness of who you would show us to be. Lord, help us to see Christ more and more in your son's name. All right, let's go in our groups. It was a while. It was, it was a very long time. <laughs> Logan was depressed.